Okay. Um, so before we uh, begin rounds, I just want to um, do a few announcements. Um, so for next week's grand rounds, our speaker will be um, Carl Tisserot, the Chen Professor of Bio Bioengineering and of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. Um, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And his talk is titled Hallucinating Mice, Dopamine and Immunity Towards Mechanistic Treatment Targets for Psychotic Disorders, the Inner Workings of Channel Redoxins and Brains. Um, as a reminder, we encourage everyone to post questions at any time during the talk today using the Q&A feature and not the chat at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you are a trainee, please put the word trainee at the beginning of your question. Um, for today's grand rounds, I will turn it over to Dr. Dixon to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I have the uh, distinct pleasure uh, this morning to introduce one of our own, uh, who is this year's winner of the Essex Award. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Essex Award and then uh, about Roberto. So Dr. Susan Essick is a retired member of our faculty, professor, and first director of the Division of Mental Health Services and Policy Research. Dr. Essick's career emphasized facilitating the translation of research findings into mental health policy and practice, addressing problems faced by mental health administrators, and evaluating the impact of behavioral health services delivered in routine practice settings. Susan is very um, concerned that, that research impact practice. Her grants, papers, awards, activities of which there were many, shared the theme of service, government service, and rigorous research. A common theme in her research has been creating scalable ways to implement new services, monitor implementation fidelity, and Susan has a special place in her heart, for monitoring fidelity and measure outcomes to assess the extent to which the intended services are indeed those being delivered. She studied messy problems in messy contexts, determined to find some simple truths that could be applied. She demanded rigor. She focused on the dual diagnosis of mental illness and substance use, medication, polypharmacy, and switching, how to use claims and how to use claims data to improve care. She was also an incredible leader a chair of too many committees to count. Dr. Essick thus endowed the Essick Lecture to be given by a mental health scholar whose work exemplifies one or more of these components. The first recipient of this award was our own Dr. Melanie Wall. The second was Dr. Colleen Barry. And this year we recognize Dr. Roberto Luis Fernandez. I can't help but mention that Roberto was in high school, a presidential scholar. He was one of um, 104 people, uh, students from around the country, one from each state, Puerto Rico and um, Virgin Islands, who was selected to be on a pre the president com presidential commission selected uh, based on academic achievement. Um, so he started his ascent um, uh, as a, a presidential scholar. He is currently a professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia, director of the New York State Center of Excellence for Cultural Competence and the Hispanic Treatment Program, and interim research area leader of the anxiety, mood, eating, and related disorders at NISPE. His research focuses on developing culturally valid interventions and instruments to en enhance patient engagement, reduce misdiagnosis, and help overcome disparities in the care of underserved cultural groups. He also studies how culture affects the individual's experience of mental disorder and their help-seeking expectations, including how to explore this cultural variation during the psychiatric evaluation. He has been PI or co-investigator of 25 NIH-funded studies focused on enhancing cultural aspects of care for diverse underserved populations as well as other funded research. He led the development of the DSM-5 cultural formulation interview, which I, I think is you know, one of the most important things to emerge uh, from this whole diagnostic morass in the last decade. It is a standardized method for cultural assessment for use in mental health practice and was the principal investigator of its international field trial. He really has been 
a central force in recognizing and then operationalizing how culture and oppression have influenced what psychiatry is and how we define constructs. His work is quintessentially practical. He creates tools and methods paying attention to validity and reliability. And he has profoundly influenced how we think about culture and ethnicity in psychiatry. And I, I think you can see how he has, he's the just an incredibly appropriate recipient of this Essex Award. So um, without further ado, Roberto. Thank you very much, Elisa, for such a kind introduction. Um, I was thinking that you can tell when you're at home when somebody is referring back to what you did in high school. That uh, that really <laughs> that gives it away. It's very nice to be giving this talk here. Um, I'm uh, about to share my slides. Um, I hope you can see them. You can see my slides well. Great. Okay, so. Uh, forgive me one moment. I just need to uh, find a way to get rid of these photographs here. Just get them out of the way. Thank you. Did it. So I really appreciate the Grand Rounds Committee inviting me to discuss this important and very timely topic. The title of the talk is Addressing Ethno-Racial Disparities in Mental Health Risk Assessment and Service Delivery. The impact of racism and other forms of discrimination is pervasive in our society, including in our academic institutions, as the events in our department have recently made clear. So it's important to address these directly in all of our work. Um, I also want to thank the sponsors of the Essex Award for this great honor. I had the pleasure of working with Susan for several years, and I'm always grateful for her support, especially during the first years of our Cultural Competence Center here at NISPE. I also wanna take a moment to thank uh, three people who helped me put this talk together. Um, uh, Michaela Rodriguez, our former uh, RA, and Shima Saragiani, our current RA, as well as Dolly John, Dr. Dolly John, who's a health services uh, specialist who works with us in the Cultural Competence Center. I have no relevant disclosures, by the, in terms of the takeaway, by the end of the talk, I intend to show that um, uh, disparities, the causes and pathways of ethno-racial disparities in mental health are very complex, that multi-level studies and strategies are needed in order to assess, to address disparities in risk of mental disorders, uh, access to and use, quality and outcomes of mental health care. Now, these uh, issues are very timely now because of the growing awareness of structural racism and ethnic discrimination in our society that has been manifested in, our, in the public eye by the attention to police violence and to disparities in COVID infection and death. And I wanted in that light to show you some data of age-adjusted COVID-19 deaths in the United States through August of 2020. And you can see the much higher death rate due to COVID among minoritized groups in the US, especially black and indigenous individuals, though you can see that in the other groups is also high relative to non-Latino whites. Now we would expect a major repercussion in the prevalence of mental health problems due to this stressor. And I will return to this in a minute, but here it's a sign of the disparities, the stressors in terms of disparity risk that are very uh, prevalent in our society. The outline of the talk is that I will cover the conceptual basis of disparities and particularly focusing on promising topics regarding disparities in mental health risk, assessment and service access and delivery. And this is important for all work in mental health because the social conditions that lead to disparities affect all aspects of mental health, including neurobiology. They're often poorly measured and if unaddressed, will, unaddressed, will continue to interfere with mental health care. Now, what are health disparities? 
This is a definition I put together from various sources. You see some of them below. Health disparities are preventable and unjust differences in health status, outcomes, and burden of disease that adversely affect socially disadvantaged populations. Now, ethno-racial disparities are only one of many kinds of disparities. I won't address them in the talk, but many of the points I raised should apply to other kinds of disparities. Now, this schematic, which is very complex, I put up precisely uh, in order to show you the complexity of the causes and pathways of health disparities. Like this, there are several available schematics, but they're all equally complicated. I won't go through it, but I wanted to highlight the fact that these causes and pathways are present not just at the individual level, but also at the systemic or institutional level, as well as the larger societal and structural level as well. And in order to understand disparities appropriately, correctly, we have to include all of these levels in our models of disparities. Otherwise, we risk really missing a lot of the important elements that would help us understand and intervene. And uh, in that sense also, we need to use, I, I wanna emphasize, it isn't just understanding, it's also any intervention that we create to tackle disparities must take account of these uh, multiple levels. Now, this complexity of the causes and mechanisms of disparities is reflected even in the prevalence of mental health disparities across the population. I will use the term BIPOC in the talk to refer to Black, Indigenous, and people of color individuals. Now, this graphic here shows or uh, is, is designed to uh, discuss the looping effect that access to care has on risk of psychopathology. Because despite higher exposure to social adversity and discrimination than in non-Latinx whites, BIPOC individuals tend not to have consistently higher prevalence of psychopathology. So it's therefore very important to focus on resilience factors as well. Because also psychopathology prevalence varies substantially both across and within ethno-racial groups. As this graphic here is meant to illustrate, BIPOC individuals do tend to have mental disorders that are more persistent, severe, and impairing and one, than, than in white uh, individuals. And one major contributor to this, as suggested here, is the consistently worse indices of mental health care they receive across the full continuum of service access and delivery. As you can see by the numbers, the percentages illustrated in the graphic. If you go around, you see how access to care is lower, initiation of care, quality of care. This specific item here about being likely to fill prescriptions and being uh, in the uh, disparities in retention in treatment. And you can see how the access to poor lower access to care in general and access to poorer care is a risk factor for creating the persistence and chronicity and impairment that we see typical of low income, especially BIPOC population. But it still remains unclear why most BIPOC groups do not have higher prevalence of mental disorders. And to illustrate this as an example, which has been called a paradox in some populations, I want to show here the prevalence of meeting a cutoff score in the symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorders and of COVID-related trauma and stressor disorders specifically among U.S. adults in April and June of 2020 as collected by the CDC at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, this is a representative sample of the U.S. population. And you, you see what's interesting about it is that although by that point, as I showed you at the first slide, first slide of the deaths from COVID, although by that point, BIPOC individuals had much higher death rates than COVID, as, from COVID than white individuals, as much as three point times higher uh, in uh, African-Americans and Black individuals, CDC data shows only a small elevation in these cutoff scores in black individuals relative to whites, even for COVID specific symptoms and like trauma and stressor 
uh, disorder rates. And in, in Asian Americans, for example, who, who in the previous slide had higher death rates, still here have lower death rates than non-Latinx whites, whereas Latinx have somewhat higher rates as is more expected from their higher death rates compared to whites. Now, why this variation in symptom reports? Many explanations exist, including whether they are artifacts of measurement, sampling, et cetera. I won't address those particular methodological reasons in this talk. Instead, I will focus on some of the other multi-level processes that contribute to these complex findings and that we need to understand in order to address disparities. We'll focus first on contributions to disparities in risk of mental disorders. And there are three parts to this discussion of risk, intersectionality, subjective appraisal, and societal structure. The first major contribution to the complexity of the disparity issue in terms of risk is intersectionality, which can be defined as the simultaneous impact of multiple aspects of identity and social position. These various aspects are associated with different social statuses, adverse exposures and access to resources. The relationship between these aspects of identity and uh, between these aspects of identity and anything else, including disparity, is complex. It's not additive, it's multiplicative. And they yield emergent effects. Intersectionality, in fact, compounds and modifies the impact of risk and protective factors. And to illustrate this, I want to show you this graph, which examines the impact of subjective social status, that is where the person thinks they fall in the social hierarchy, on the probability of mood or anxiety disorder across two Asian Im immigrant groups who migrated at different ages. In the graph, in the x-axis, social status ranges from one, the lowest, to 10, the highest. And there are two groups of Asians portrayed here, those who migrated before age 25 in the blue, the line at the top, and those who migrated after age 25 in the purple line at the bottom. And what this graph shows is that subjective social status only impacts the probability of disorder for Asians immigrating at age 25 or older. Subjective social status did not impact the probability of mood or anxiety disorder for those who immigrated before age 25, as you see in the blue line, which is nearly flat. Despite the fact that they had, the, the, those who immigrated younger, had greater, had greater educational and income gains than Asians who immigrated at older ages. This shows the intra-group heterogeneity and uh, in terms of the, this particular uh, uh, act, act element of intersectionality migration as illustrated by it, and the need to disaggregate ethnic, ethno-racial background whenever possible to identify intra-group disparities. Intersectionality therefore helps explain intra and intergroup disparities. And we risk not understanding, remaining unclear, everything about psychopathology remaining unclear if we don't examine factors like intersectionality in our analysis. I'll give you a second example about the value of intersectionality in understanding health risk, this time based on biomarkers. And these are data on allostatic load which can be defined as the accumulated physiological burden imposed by stress over time. And it is usually assessed by a combination, measures vary, but it's a combination of measures, including cardiovascular, metabolic, inflammatory, and neuroendocrine biomarkers. For example, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, hemoglobin A1C, uh, C-reactive protein, cortisol. These are some of the markers included. Now, allostatic load is associated, it's a useful marker because it's associated with the development of PTSD and major depression, for example, after childhood trauma. And it's also associated with po positive symptoms and brain changes in psychotic disorders, such as in schizophrenia. And it's used in disparities research as an indicator of stress 
due to social disadvantage, especially the physical tax levied by living in a race conscious society. Now I'm about to show you results from a classic paper by Arlene Geronimus based on nationally representative national Haynes data on adults 18 to 64. It examines 10 biomarkers and it assigns one point for every biomarker that falls in the upper or lower quartile of the sample, depending on whether upper, low, high or low is good or bad for you. This, this is all the bad uh, 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 values of the marker on the upper or lower quartile. The sum scores are go from zero to 10 and with higher scores indicating higher probability of morbidity. And what I'm going to about to show you is the estimated probability of high allostatic load, which is a score of four or more biomarkers as a function of age that is analyzed separately by race, gender and poverty income ratio, which is a poverty to needs variable. This first graph shows you on the y-axis, the estimated probability of a high allostatic load, and in the x-axis, the age of the sample. And it shows you the distribution by uh, race and gender. And you see how at the top, being black, <clears throat> whether a woman worse, women worse than men, but both black groups are higher than both white groups in, in terms of the allostatic load that you see uh, that, that the, the, the probability of having a high allostatic load, which is therefore associated with morbidity. And you see how they're, as I was saying, they're clustered by race. Gender is, and race both go together in this finding. Um, and this second graph shows the probability of a high allostatic load by race up here and by race, and then in addition by poverty marker. And what it shows, <clears throat> again, is a higher, allostatic load among black individuals, but both poor and non-poor compared to whites. Here, for example, you see that black non-poor have a worse allostatic load than white poor. These data show the impact of racism and sexism, even when accounting for social uh, SES, socioeconomic status. And the racialized difference is highest among non-poor women age 55 to 64. In that group of women of that age, black women had, who were non-poor, black women had five times the odds of high load, allostatic load compared to white women. This indicates again, the value of including intersectionality in our analyses of risk here in terms of rate, before it was immigration, here it's in terms of gender, race, and class. However, too often intersectionality is not addressed in the analysis. When addressed, it's often in the form of regressions or via interaction analyses, which is fine, but they require large sample sizes. Uh, the other uh, way of doing it typically is through intersection terms like black men versus black women, but, uh, but, uh, but, and that is fine and can be done with small samples. But there are a number of other alternatives for how to examine intersectionality. I won't have time to go through them in detail, but briefly, they're listed here. One uh, alternative approach is to take a life course uh, approach and compare the trajectories of psychopathology over time. That is to say, examine the effect of cum cumulative disadvantage, how risk factors accumulate and interact longitudinally in different ways across ethno-racial groups or subgroups to yield distinct mental health outcomes. A life course approach can also identify specific life periods of relative vulnerability or resilience, critical periods. And you can test whether these coincide or different across ethno-racial groups or subgroups, such as by gender or SES. Network analysis can compare the interconnections among symptoms, examining whether these networks vary across ethno-racial groups or subgroups. Latent class models may identify specific clusters of identity characteristics that are associated with a given mental health outcome. This may, for example, simplify the search for relevant aspects of intersectionality by clustering them into latent constructs. And you can identify commonality and different commonalities and differences across intra ethno-racial subgroups, possibly even creating typologies that can be tested in other databases. Finally, I find this one particularly interesting. 
decomposition analyses are counterfactual experiments with the data in which one aspect of intersectionality, say income, is artifactually altered at a time to observe its effect on other variables, such as a mental health outcome. This process can reveal that certain aspects of identity or social position play a particularly important role in the risk of psychopathology, identifying ways in, with, in which ethno-racial subgroups differ on that respect, in that respect or are similar. These are all ways to examine data in order to clarify the contributions to psychopathology risk from specific interrelationships among intersectional characteristics. A second contributor to the complexity of risk across ethno-racial groups is the person's own interpretation of experience, which I'm call, it's called, I'm calling here subjective appraisal. This is central to classic stress theories because appraisal modifies the impact of objectively assessed stressors. Subjective appraisal helps explain why there is so much intra and inter ethno racial group variability in the association of objective measures of adversity and mental health disparities. You would think without subjective appraisal that you could just uh, measure the impact of objective measures and it should be the same across individuals or groups, but it isn't. It's obviously always filtered and experienced through subjective appraisal. I'll give you an example now in the next slide. Subjective appraisal can in fact, as this example will show, have even greater effect on psychopathology than objectively defined risk factors. This is shown in this study by Sidra Goldman Meller's group, which involves an ethno-racially diverse representative sample of adolescents ages 12 to 17 in California from the California Health Interview Survey. It examined the relationship of the person's own perception of the safety of their neighborhood, their own experience of it, and compared that to an objectively defined measure of neighborhood safety. In this case, the violent crime rate which was obtained from law enforcement data geocoded to the participant's address. And the investigators used the Kessler six scale, the K6, as a measure of serious psychological distress. And what the graph shows is that adjusting for individual family and other neighborhood level covariates, that is to say all these data are adjusted by individual family and neighborhood level covariates. Both subjective and objective measures had an impact on the effect, had an, eff and an effect, sorry, on the prevalence of serious psychological distress. As you can see on the y-axis, here's the prevalence of serious psychological effects, and here's perceived neighborhood safety on the left, and objectively measured neighborhood violence from crime rates on the right. And you can see they both have a, a you know an, an odds ratio above one but the odds ratio for the subjective experience was higher and statistically significant where at, compared to the odds ratio for the objectively measured uh, finding. And this effect of perceived safety remains unchanged even when objectively measured neighborhood violence was included as a covariate. Even if you add the objective measure into the equation, not only the individual factors, but the neighborhood objectively measured violence, you still get this uh, is the adjusted odds ratio for the subjective, uh, uh, the, sub the effect of the subjective appraisal, even taking that into account. So we have really valuable data here. So far, I've covered two aspects, intersectionality and subjective appraisal that show why the risk of psychopathology would differ so much across subgroups, groups, and even individuals. I'm gonna add a third element now to intersectionality, subjective appraisal, and that is societal structure. This is a third contributor to the complexity of ethno-racial disparities, is the ways that societies are organized and how this differentially affects ethno-racial groups and subgroups. And by that, I mean, the foundational source of forces like laws, built environment, social environment. These are, these are ways that pattern an individual's access to adversity, exposure to adversity, access to resources, and so on. And these uh, ways societies are organized are manifest, the, the, uh, are, create the manifestations that we call social determinants of health. That is to say, social determinants reflect these aspects of social structure. 
Among these aspects of these factors, structural factors, racialized residential segregation plays a key role. This was defined by David Williams as the physical separation of racialized groups by enforced residents in certain areas, which is an institutional mechanism of racism. Now, residential segregation patterns the exposures to everyday stressors and major adverse events, such as violence, as well as opportunities. And therefore, it's an example of how societal structure helps explain the impact of social position on intra and intergroup disparities. And here you see as an example, a study by Fuang Do's group with a nationally representative sample of black and white participants ages 25 and older, residing in large and ethno-racially diverse metropolitan areas coming from with data coming from the National Health Interview Survey. These are the black participants I'm showing you now. And what the study showed, examined was the relationship between a geocoded neighborhood level index of residential segregation, how uneven is the racial distribution of the geographical area. It uh, examined the relations between that and self-reported Kessler-6 data, which is taken here as another, again, as a measure of serious psychological distress. And what these, uh, what, the, what the data, how the analysis proceeded was by stratifying a third element. So it's the serious psychological distress, the ethno, the racialized segregation, and in addition, the income level, the poverty level of the neighborhood. And the neighborhoods were stratified as low and high poverty levels using census data. And what this graph shows is that after adjusting for individual characteristics, including family income, segregation, racialized segregation was associated with significantly higher odds of serious psychological distress among black respondents, but only in the high poverty areas. You see that here, the odds and the, under the low poverty level are non-significant, whereas the odds in the high poverty level, the impact, the relationship between racialized segregation and serious psychological distress is significant in the high poverty levels. In the black sample, because in the white sample, in the same study, there was no association between racialized residential segregation and psychological distress, either overall or by neighborhood poverty level. This shows the importance of ethno-racial disparities of two structural variables, residential segregation and neighborhood poverty. And it highlights the need to include structural level, level data to clarify ethno-racial disparities in risk of psychopathology. So I'm about to wrap up this section on risk by discussing future directions for possible mental health research involving risk. Going forward, what should this area focus on? One area that I hope I've shown or argued for is the longitudinal multi-level examination of the uh, disparities in risk in diverse population. It needs to be multi-level and it's best if it's done over time. We need both population level designs and tailored approaches. We need them both because the, we need the population level studies to get the big picture, but we need to follow up with tailored studies of specific ethno-racial groups and subgroups to avoid missing ways in which risks of psychopathology affect specific subgroups and that can be, this, which can cause disparities to worsen if they're unattended. We can, it's the idea that a rising tide does not lift all boats equally. You, in, in, a, in, in tackling some forms of low acts, low of risk in this case, you might actually uh, improve the, the health of some populations and not others, therefore worsening disparities. That's why you need tailored approaches too. We also need to go beyond the symptoms. You saw how many had K6 as its outcome to examine disorders. We need more innovative measures to examine intersectionality. I covered several of them. But in addition, we could use machine learning to derive novel structural targets from large linked databases, such as the US Census and Medicaid data. And we need to examine intergenerational effects, which is another mechanism by which 
the impacts of oppression over time get uh, perpetuated in societies. This is uh, intergenerational. It's another way that disparities uh, manifest and uh, in which adversities in the parents are transmitted to their offspring via parenting effects, both epigenetically and psychologically, as well as structurally. Myrna Weissman, Cristiani Duarte, their colleagues here at, uh, at Columbia are in, you know, working in this area very well. And these are all uh, important contributors to, uh, to disparities that we need to tackle. I'm now gonna to turn to mental health assessment. I've already given you some examples of how to measure intersectionality, subjective appraisal and structural factors. Now I'm gonna focus on how to assess these important variables in clinical research and how to include in mental health care. And I'm going to uh, address two aspects of this issue, person-centered contextual assessment and communication and implicit bias. Now, person-centered contextual assessment includes a person's wants, needs, abilities, and circumstances from the perspective of the person and significant others. And it obtains information on intersectionality, appraisal, and social structure, complementing generic assessments in research and clinical work. And let me tell you what I mean by generic assessments that are complemented by person-centered assessments. These are the usual kinds of assessments that people might do in mental health if they're just doing a non-person-centered approach, which is finding out demographic indicators, assessing symptoms, living arrangements, food insecurity. These are, these are fine as they go. However, it's good to supplement them with person-centered uh, uh, evaluations, assessments that address from the perspective of the person, their lived experience, their family, their friends, communities, and so on. So in terms of intersectionality, in, in terms of, instead of just asking about demographic indicators, we can ask the person about the most relevant aspect of their own identity. In terms of appraisal, we can ask their views of trouble, the most troubling aspect of the problem or their own experiences of discrimination. And in terms of structure, we could ask about perceived barriers to care, whether they're scared to walk in the neighborhood. You see how it's their own personal experience of it. And I'm taking these, uh, these examples here under the person-centered column from two existing person-centered instruments. I, meaning I didn't make those up in that sense. I took them from the cultural formulation interview and from the structure of vulnerability questionnaire that Philippe Bourgois group uh, at UCLA and other colleagues have developed. And I'll say more here now about the cultural formulation interview, which is one example of a person-centered contextual assessment method. As Lisa mentioned, it was developed for DSM-5 uh, based on the DSM-4 cultural formulation framework, which is a framework for organizing and interpreting information on the impact of cultural and social contexts on the experience of mental and emotional distress based on the views and practices of the person and their social network. The CFI was developed by an international group of developers led by our Cultural Competence Center here at NISPI. We're very proud of that, of the work we've been doing there, our whole group. And it can be used for initial clinical evaluation and treatment planning with any patient by any provider in any care setting. It has three components. The core CFI, which is the assessment of the individual, has 16 questions. I'll briefly run through the four domains of it in a minute. Then there's an informant version, we call it, for uh, obtaining uh, uh, parallel information from, uh, from a, a companion, as well as 12 supplementary modules that can deepen the assessment. Um, these are the four domains of the cultural formulation interview, the definition of the problem, their, their perceptions of cause, context, and support, including those of their social network, the factors that affect their coping and help seeking in the past, and their current preferences and help seeking choices and concerns, possible concerns about the clinician patient relationship. Now, we recommend that this would be done at the beginning of an initial clinical evaluation, but it can be done at any point in the clinical assessment whenever it's found, whenever the, the clinician feels or the person feels that uh, there's a concern about the impact of sociocultural issues. The field trial was conducted in six countries and 11 sites with 318 patients, 75 clinicians, and 86 relatives. 
Um, it was uh, testing, it tested the uh, feasibility, acceptability, and utility of the tool. It was found to be all those things by patients, clinicians, and uh, relatives, especially after one administration of it. So you, you practice it once, and by the second administration, you were not concerned about feasibility, acceptability, et cetera. And it was also found to enhance rapport, communication, and expressions of caring. The map shows you where the sites were. We, our center has been publishing on this uh, since DSM. Um, and in addition, there's been work not in the field trial and also other people not in the field trial have been publishing on CFI, but uh, uh, in particular, I wanted to highlight this aspect, which is that as a training tool, it has been shown to increase the cultural competence of psychiatric trainees. Now, this slide refers to research on the impact of cultural formulation on diagnostic assessment. And here, the um, instrument, the method used to conduct the cultural formulation was not the CFI. It's pre this is work previous to the CFI appearance by a group of people who participated in creating the CFI. This is work from the McGill group in Montreal. And what it shows is how a cultural formulation framework approach, they operationalized it in their own way with their own protocol that contributed to the CFI, how that kind of approach can improve the accuracy and completeness of diagnostic evaluation. What uh, this refers to is to over 300 patients referred to the cultural consultation service at McGill from all over the city of Montreal whenever clinicians or other providers in the city felt that there was something going on in their care that needed a cultural consultation, they referred the patient for consultation and sometimes the clinician and so on to uh, the McGill service. And what they found, and, and what they found with this 323 patients, most of whom were immigrants and refugees over age 16, was that nearly half of them who came in with a referral diagnosis of psychosis or rule out psychosis were re-diagnosed as not being psychotic. That is to say that blue bar there, 49%, shows that 70 people who came in with a psychotic diagnosis after going through the culture formulation approach lost their psychotic disorder diagnosis. They were essentially over-diagnosed in the opinion of this assessment as being psychotic. They often had PTSD, adjustment disorder. Sometimes they had been, you know, many had been traumatized, conflict zones, and they were expressing experiences of distress that were confused for psychosis. And in the other direction, the 5% who came in without a diagnosis of psychosis, only 5% were flipped over. Sometimes psychosis is missed. But most of the time in these populations, psychosis is overdiagnosed. This matches the work with African-Americans and other Black communities in the US and elsewhere about the overdiagnosis of schizophrenia in particular in those communities. Uh, in that respect, I wanted to mention briefly the work of Tekle Sandi in the, her group in the Netherlands, which studied Moroccan immigrants versus Dutch natives in terms of diagnosis of schizophrenia. And they, th they did three very nice studies. And what they showed was that a cultural formulation approach also preceding the CFI, but in the same family of, of approaches, increased the diagnostic agreement between Dutch and Moroccan psychiatrists. So if, you, if the, you had Dutch and Moroccan psychiatrists assessing Dutch and Moroccan patients, and the, uh, without the cultural formulation approach, there was very little, very low agreement between the Dutch and Moroccan psychiatrists about the Moroccan patients, much higher agreement with the Dutch patients. If you added a cultural formulation approach, that difference disappeared. A second study looked at the stability of the schizophrenia diagnosis in Moroccans over 30 months and found much higher stability, similar to Dutch patients, when they used a cultural formulation approach. And then they also, a third study examined the relative risk of schizophrenia, the estimates of schizophrenia among Moroccans versus native Dutch in, uh, in the population. And they found a much an overblown relative risk of schizophrenia, 7.5 times higher risk uh, 
among Moroccan uh, uh, patients than in Dutch patients. When they used a cultural formulation approach, that relative risk went down to 1.5. So a little higher in immigrants, which is consistent with immigrant data from many parts of the world, but not seven times higher, which is just another way of overdiagnosing schizophrenia in certain populations. Earlier I mentioned, <clears throat> sorry, that subjective appraisal, I'm switching gears a tiny bit now, but still within assessment, that subjective appraisal can have a major impact on ethno-racial disparities in outcomes. Here, I want to focus on the fact that that appraisal, subjective appraisal, is not just idiosyncratic to the individual, but emerges from cultural traditions of what symptoms mean, how they are experienced, and how they are reported to clinicians, researchers, family, et cetera. These traditions are transmitted by ethno-racial groups and subgroups, including with great intra-group variation, and they also change over time. I wanted to illustrate this by showing you this list of Latinx Caribbean cultural concepts of distress. These are ways in which people experience and express distress, a sort of folk nosology. Now note that uh, the, uh, some cultural concepts are held widely across Caribbean Latinx groups, like being anything about nerves is very widely heard, uh, held. I'm sure if you've treated this population, you've heard about nervios. Other, uh, or concerns about being crazy, but other elements of this nosology are specific to certain subgroups, like facultades is one that's particularly specific to spiritists. And like that, there's many kinds of cultural concepts of distress. And I wanted to contrast them, their relationship with the list of DSM-5 diagnoses. And what I'm going to show you is that the relationship between the two nosologies is never one-to-one. -one. I've never found one in anywhere in the world that is simply one-to-one. -one. The, the folk nosologies, the popular nosologies are organized differently than the professional nosologies. What makes a concept hang together, like having facultades in the Latinx Caribbean, is, does not exist as a held together construct in the, uh, in the uh, professional nosology and sometimes vice versa. What makes a construct a professional category is not what is considered in the popular nosology to, com to compose uh, a syndrome. And so the relationship is always one to many in both directions, um, in both directions. If you work with this population, you have heard a million times somebody coming in and telling you that they're sick with nerves they mean something by it. There's something that hangs together for them about that experience, about vulnerability, treatment, experience, relationship to others, vulner, you know, all sorts of things. But they, they, they are, from the point of view of psychiatry, heterogeneous with respect to its, uh, to its diagnostic value. So what needs to happen is that we need to translate from one form of experience, in this case, the person's own person-centered experience into the diagnostic categories. And this variation affects not only clinical care, but anything that depends on asking people about their symptoms or experience, including most mental health research. It means that in this kind of mental health assessment, we cannot assume a universalism in the relationship between symptom reports and disorders. It has to be a process of translation as in different languages. Now I'm gonna to turn to the last element of the uh, assessment section, which is on poor communication and implicit bias. These are elements that also affect and impair the process of communication and uh, affect many clinicians seeing BIPOC patients. Implicit biases are unconscious automatic mental associations between a social group, stereotypes, and forms of prejudice. Anti-Black implicit bias is particularly prominent in the US due to structural racism. Now, poor communication and implicit bias affect rapport and the exchange of information in clinical care and research, including the quality of the data obtained on intersectionality, appraisal, and structural factors. Importantly, this interference in communication is associated with lower quality of care and patient disengagement. Now, communication processes may respond to intervention, but research uh, on implicit bias, which is ongoing, 
so far shows that brief interventions on implicit bias appear much less effective. Longer interventions may be more eff effective, but require institutional buy-in, which is very important. So in terms of future research directions, in terms of assessment, we need to continue to study the impact of assessment on information exchange and processes of care. The association between implicit bias, observed clinician behavior and patient outcomes is a very important area for research. How, is, how does intervening in implicit bias help or how does implicit bias make things worse? Um, how does uh, the impact of, what is the impact of sociocultural assessment on longitudinal patient outcomes? What are the best implementation strategies for disparity reducing interventions in routine care? For example, we could program the electronic health record to automatically present community level data that is geocoded to the patient's address that is relevant to the symptoms or diagnoses entered by the clinician. For example, if the clinician enters PTSD, maybe they could show you the crime rate for that neighborhood. We need to do longitudinal studies of the effects of training, as I mentioned on implicit bias, which uh, can be, you know, on versions of implicit bias training that can be applied in routine clinical and, practice and research settings. And we also need to test alternative approaches for improving clinician behavior. And by that, I mean testing, for example, testing incentives to change behavior, such as value-based care, or address biases that structure the work environment, such as equity in ethno-racial, gender, or sexual orientation salaries, or representation in the leadership, and see the effect downstream on implicit bias reduction, for example. Now I'm going to turn to mental health service access and delivery. I'll cover five strategies briefly for each one. Engaging with communities, tailoring for a specific subgroup, leveraging technology to reduce disparities, improving patient provider communication, and intervening on social inequities. For each strategy, I'll present the primary target or targets it addresses among the following four things I mentioned in the talk, intersectionality, subjective appraisal, structural factors, and poor communication and implicit bias. I'll tell you what approach the research followed, and then an example of an intervention or implementation approach illustrating the strategy. And for each intervention or implementation approach, first I'll say the problem the intervention or implementation approach is addressing, and then how it's going about it and what results have been obtained so far. The first strategy can be used to target any of the factors we've discussed so far. It involves organizing how, organizing how researchers or clinicians engage with communities to implement a given intervention in a real world setting. These interventions can be pitched at individual, interpersonal or family, organizational, community and policy levels at any level. And this approach ensures engagement with community partners is authentic, not superficial. Superficial. It's composed of a three part approach, as summarized in a 2015 Cochrane review on this type of community based strategy. You see them here be aware of multiple forces at all levels, invest in community participation, and prioritize community mental health and social outcomes. And uh, Enrico Castillo, whom you may remember, was uh, graduated from our residency program, uh, recently did a very nice 2019 literature review which found seven main areas in which this kind of community-focused implementation approach is currently being used and studied. You see them here. I won't read them out loud in the interest of time, but you can see how diverse they are. I'm gonna now give you an example of that uh, community-based approach. Here, the problem is called Community Partners in Care, and it's the work of Kenneth Wells and Loretta Jones, and now she passed away, unfortunately, her daughter Felicia Jones in, uh, in California, in LA. And the problem that it's uh, uh, tackling is the limited access to major depression care in low income communities. And the approach consists of coalition building of multi sectoral community based organizations to engage stakeholders in a collaborative care model including major depressive services in primary care. So how to improve access to community collaborative care services by doing this coalition building. And the sectors in the coalition include outpatient primary care and mental health services, substance use and homelessness programs, and other community programs as well, faith-based, et cetera. And 
what you see here is, I'm going to report in a minute, are the results of this RCT in which they compare this coalition building approach to uh, a regular usual care kind of program level implementation of a toolkit and technical assistance, meaning the usual ways of engaging communities by providing webinars, having meetings and so on, but without building the coalition an equal partnership among all the partners co-led by community members and so on. And they followed these people for four years. And at six months, which is also impressive, at six months, they found improved clinically and community defined outcomes. But I wanted to show you here the data from the four year follow-up, which in, in, in found reductions in chronic medical conditions and improvements in clinical remission, which are defined according to THQ-9 and things like that, as well as community defined revision, re remissions, which are defined in terms of wellness uh, 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 questions, uh, homelessness, risk, fa risk factors, and so on. You see what very high impact they had at four years from a coalition building approach. The second uh, intervention strategy involves tailoring for a specific subgroup. And it typically, uh, uh, what it is involved is a, a kind of a subtype of a community-based implementation strategy that I mentioned in the previous slides. And what makes this uh, intervention strategy unique is that the primary target is intersectionality of community participants. That is to say, they wanna tailor services, organize the services around aspects of identity or structural position. For example, uh, focusing on faith-based elements or school or homeless or criminal justice system, tailoring the intervention for work with those communities to leverage their subgroup commonalities to address disparities. Here's an example of church-based mental health services that comes from, uh, from Sydney Hankerson's work here in our own department. Now, unfortunately, Sydney is at Sinai, but he's still collaborating with many people here. Um, this work was started when he was here. And the problem that he's, was, his group was addressing was that many black community members with major depression are less likely than the white community members to receive treatment. And uh, there are many barriers for the, that cause this in the black communities, lack of access to care, concern about whether care can be trusted, stigma issues, et cetera. So what Sydney did was partner with faith communities um, in order to uh, leverage the fact that black individuals in the US have the highest rate of church attendance among all ethno-racial groups in the country. So this is a, a logical place to focus a, a community outreach uh, you know, practice uh, research intervention. And what uh, Sydney's group did is screen with the help of, mental, of community health workers who were themselves uh, church members, screen for the presence of major depression in the community, of, in this case, in the church community, uh, using the PHQ-9. And they found very high rates of probable MDD, scores of 10 or more on the PHQ-9, but not a single participant um, accepted mental health treatment referral, indicating the size of the problem. So in this currently funded R01, what Sydney is doing is um, uh, testing uh, this uh, clinical trial, doing a clinical trial of SBIRT, which is screening brief intervention and referral to treatment for major, focused on major depression versus enhanced usual care. And here the enhanced element means that they are, each person is actually getting a 30 to 45 minute session in which they get uh, psychoeducation, they get connected to insurance if they don't have insurance, they get lists of referrals, they get resources for social needs. So it's a better than usual care, but com comparing it to this more tailored approach that is designed with this church community in mind, conducted by interventionists who are community members. And uh, here are the outcomes you see, and he's gonna also assess the uh, implementation elements. This is ongoing. I'm very glad that NIMH funded this. They should fund many more like this. A third intervention that I, uh, implementation strategy I want to focus on has to do with leveraging technology to reduce disparities. And the primary target usually is structural barriers to accessing care and appraisal elements such as stigma, for example, of accessing specialty mental health services. And the approach is by facilitating the remote access or engagement in services and also encouraging self-help 
through technological means. And these are the modalities you see here that uh, convey this uh, use of technology. There are three kinds. One is telemental health, where care is delivered, traditional services are delivered remotely. We are very familiar with that now. Another one is technology-mediated self-help, which is on-demand interactive apps or websites. And then a third modality is technological adjuncts, where interventions, typical traditional interventions, are enhanced by technological means, whether uh, textual re text reminders that the person should come to care or virtual reality approaches. Um, now, games, which is what I'm going to mention in a minute, fall, for example, to practice CBT skills, can function both as treatment adjuncts or as self-help approaches. And uh, these have been found, many of them, to be clinically effective and to reduce logistical barriers and stigma. One point that must be mentioned involves the digital divide, which is a common concern about use of technology in BIPOC and low-income groups. But I would just say that the divide is complex. US Latinx, for example, are similar to whites in smartphone use, but they face more financial barriers, so they're less likely to have home broadband and they have more data caps. So the divide depends on the type of modality, as well as other factors, such as the age distribution of the population. Now, I'm going to present to you the findings from this approach, Smart Sparks, which is defined, basically, it spells out as smart, positive, active, realistic, X-factor thoughts. This is a game that has been developed to tackle the problem of limited youth engagement in traditional therapies for major depression. And what it is, is a CBT-based fantasy video game for youth with mild to moderate depression, composed of seven modules, which are like seven game levels, over four to seven weeks that target NATS, gloomy negative automatic thoughts. And these seven levels tackle uh, topics, uh, each one for a different, uh, each topic for a different level, finding hope, being active, dealing with emotions, <clears throat> overcoming problems, recognizing unhelpful thoughts, challenging unhelpful thoughts, and bringing it all together. Those are the seven levels. And at the onset and end of each module, the participant interacts with a guide in the computer that puts the game in context, provides education, gauges mood, and sets and monitors real-life challenges equivalent to homework. This is entirely self-help. There's no clinician contact. This study was developed and conducted in New Zealand in 24 primary healthcare setting, seeking settings. So um, largely school-based and youth clinics with a few PCPs. And the RCT is conducting a <clears throat> non-inferiority analysis versus treatment as usual, which was mostly face-to-face -face counseling in almost 90% of the uh, participants, usually at school clinics and youth clinics. And what they focused on is uh, youth ages 12 to 19, so adolescents. And you see the ethnic breakdown there. This is, remember, New Zealand. So indigenous folks are a high group there. Um, and what I'm showing you are the findings for the, uh, the, the results of the comparison, the reduction in the children's depression scale revised in the per protocol group sample and in the intent to treat sample. The per protocol is the uh, group that did at least four of the modules and the intent to treat is everybody who entered the study. The four of the modules was 86% of the ITT sample. So it's a very desirable thing. The game, people like to do the game. They did at least four and 60% did all seven. Now, what this shows is that the, uh, the uh, game was not inferior to treatment as usual, which you will remember was mostly face-to-face -face counseling. In fact, that p-value of 0.08 almost indicates that in the per-protocol group, the game was almost significantly better than the treatment as usual. It was at least non-inferior. And when they followed them at three months, they found that the, uh, the, the effects persisted and that in, in addition to observer-rated depression uh, symptoms like the scale, they also, the, the uh, game was non-inferior in other symptoms as well and self-reported symptoms as well. The fourth, uh, I'm gonna be finishing in about five minutes. The fourth uh, 
implementation strategy or intervention approach is improving patient provider communication. And it targets these elements, patient appraisal, clinician bias, and dyadic communication through this approach of enhancing communication content and context between patient and clinician most of the time. Now, a systematic lit review on patient provider com communication conducted by Neil Agarwal in our center identified two examples of these aspects of communication that are targeted in intervention in the interventions. These are the content and context I mentioned. You see content as the exchange of ideas about illness and treatment, and the context as interpersonal situation and influences that affect this exchange. And when he did that uh, lit review, he found these examples. These are all from the treatment initiation phase. Each phase of treatment has different concerns. Uh, for, uh, these are patient concerns, for example, about content, whether the services are useful or appropriate, stigma concerns in terms of context, issues about discord and communication styles. For example, will the clinician be telling me what to do, which is what I expect, as opposed to asking me open-ended questions or vice versa, or discomfort discussing emotions with strangers. These are examples. And I'm giving you uh, illustration from a, a study, an approach followed by Maggie Alegria's group at Harvard tackling called DECIDE, which is an acronym for a long set of steps, decide the problem, explore the question and so on, ending with enjoy a shared solution. It's an acronym for that whole process of that uh, she developed for and with her group for this uh, uh, intervention. And what they're tackling is the poor participatory nature of most of the mental health treatment received by BIPOC individuals. So it's low participation that they are uh, in, included in the treatment, which often leads to poor care and outcomes. And the way uh, Maggie's group did this is by training folks, both patients and clinicians, to enhance patient activation and shared decision making. Where she first developed the patient approach, the coaching sessions, their care manager developed coaching sessions with patients in which they're uh, trained essentially to identify their own priorities and identify questions they want to raise with their clinicians. And then in a subsequent study, she trained the clinicians how to receive them because they felt that the clinicians had not received this activated patient in a very, uh, in, you know, way that improved the quality of the participatory nature. So they increased the training for clinicians. And what I'm showing you here are the data uh, the impact on shared decision-making assessed by a blinded coder in this forearm RCT with over 300 patients. This was a PCORI grant where any clinician coding increased shared decision-making. You could see it here. And maximal coded, coding, coaching, sorry, that's what I meant. Maximal coaching, minimal, any coaching improved uh, shared decision-making, maximal coaching increased it even more. And it maximal coaching also was associated with patients' own expression that they had uh, a better quality of care. The last example I'm going to give you is on intervening directly on structural factors, on social inequalities. This is a way of thinking outside the box of what is usually considered clinical responsibilities. And the approach consists of connecting the person directly to resources such as connecting them to housing, education, and so on. And to part, by partnering with stakeholders to identify the best intervention targets for that particular group or person. And to, it's very important that as part of this, mechanisms and process factors are assessed because there are so many intervening variables between improving a person's housing and an improved uh, mental health outcome that it's very important to try to trace the mechanisms. And it's also very important to do a longitudinal evaluation because they take time to have an impact and also to have a sustainability. It's not fair in these interventions to give people something and then take it away. That, that's just not, not only not right, it's just not tenable as an intervention. Um, so the sustainability element is an important part of this kind of research. And just to illustrate it, I'm showing you a project that our center is carrying out. This is Oscar Jimenez Solomon's group called From Hardship to Hope, which is tackling the problem of high objective financial hardship, meaning in BIPOC communities, they have a lot of financial needs. And these objective hardships are associated with suicide-related outcomes. 
And we see elevated suicidal ideation and attempts in some BIPOC groups. This has been growing in some groups, particularly adolescent black men in recent years, Latino adolescents as well. Luckily that we are only seeing a slow growth in death by suicide. So that also shows some resilience, but there's very high rates of suicidal ideation and attempts. And what uh, this uh, group uh, is doing is creating a financial empowerment intervention to reduce risk of suicidal ideation and behavior in a diverse community sample at risk for suicide funded by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And the focus is on providing um, training in how to address non-clinical economic determinants of suicide risk, which can be paired with clinical approaches, but it's a different approach. For example, by providing group sessions and one-on-one -on -one coaching, coaching and connections to financial co-counseling programs, such as tax preparation, debt reduction, and so on, that, that improve wellness and reduce, uh, uh, improve objective financial wellness, so reduce debt, and also improve subjective financial wellness, reduce shame about financial troubles, increase hope and so on in order to lead to a suicide reduction in suicidal ideation and behavior. This is at the very beginning stages. So we're interested in what is going to show. Barbara Stanley is working with our group to advise us. In terms of future directions then for this area of uh, service access and delivery, what should research focus on? Here are some suggestions. Reconcile community and academic use of primary targets for intervention. Identify the optimal partnership structures for multi-sectoral collaboration, not only within mental health, but also education, corrections, et cetera. Address diversity of risk within population-wide interventions. Not all groups have the same risk and the interventions may match them variously. Assemble parsimonious, but multi-level intervention packages and balance scalability and effectiveness in early intervention designs. Don't start down a path of something that is impossible to use. Remember from the beginning uh, whether something can be scaled up in the end. So to conclude, I hope I've shown you in the talk that causes and pathways of ethno-racial disparities are complex. They're affected by all the factors that I raised and then some that I haven't had time to discuss. We need research designs in partnership with communities that are longitudinal, multi-level and multi-sectoral that target community and individual as well as objective and subjective factors. We need to tailor interventions and implementation strategies to specific contexts. We need to assess mechanisms and processes to guide replicability and sustainability. And we also need to realize that we need to know more, but we know a lot already. We must implement what is known, fill the knowledge gaps and iteratively reassess to test causes and pathways of disparities and ways to eliminate them. We, it's very important that we have leadership and institutional will in this area because we can't just keep studying and not trying to intervene. I wanna thank my uh, colleagues uh, at the center and other colleagues and uh, thank you very much also for your attention during my talk. I'm going to stop sharing. I'm, I'm just speechless, Roberto. Thank you so much. It was that was just a, such a compelling, organized. I need to watch it two or three more times to sort of feel like I've absorbed. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, uh, I have so many, but I I want to I want to get some participation here. So, um, Kate? okay, yeah. So we have a few questions in the Q and A, and and some more are coming in. So I just want to um, a couple popped up during the um, presentation that I think as you as you went through you you answered them. Although one um, anonymous attendee just asked a question: um, the allostatic load study that you presented information on. They were curious whether the um, study includes information pertaining to race and sexual orientation. Um, interested in learning how that looks within the LGBT community. I don't believe, I don't, the paper did not report it that I remember about sexual orientation. I don't know if the uh, authors gathered that information, but it, it is definitely a legitimate and important area of disparities that need to be addressed. 
There are so many, th this is one of many types of disparities. Uh, this is a very important one. It's just that my talk was focused on the ethno-racial one and I don't think this paper discussed that. Okay, so then um, a quick question from, um, from Bill Tucker. He wants to know how long it takes to learn to perform the CFI reasonably well. This is That's a question I at least I know the answer to. Um, uh, we uh, <clears throat> we uh, um, examined this in the, uh, in the international field trial. Uh, I can answer in two ways. There are standard, there's a standard way in which we do it, which involves uh, watching a certain kind of video in, 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 and module. It's uh, included in the CPI uh, uh, service and it's free of access for people who work with public. Uh, populations in the New York State, it has a small fee for people elsewhere in the world. But there's a kind of a, a, a once one hour approach to hearing how to do it. And then when there is more time, we can train people by uh, question and answer discussion and then by supervision. We haven't compared all these different approaches, but there's different levels of doing it. What we can say is that when we did uh, use that equivalent, similar to that version in the international field trial, not exactly that same training module, but a similar content. After one administration of the CFI, the number of minutes of using the CFI decreased. So from 26 minutes out of a 60 some minute interview, it went to 22 minutes out of a 50 some minute interview and it went, kept going down over time, the next four or five trainings. So after one training, they low, they, the number of minutes it took to do it, it went down to a more manageable level, about 20 minutes. And the difference in terms of concerns about feasibility disappeared with respect to acceptability and utility. So that's another way of answering the question of how to train. Um, okay, so a, no, a question from uh, Brian Fallon, who wanted to know um, what factors increase resilience to COVID-19 stress? Um, he noted that he thinks that the Black community did not have higher levels of comparative stress during COVID-19, um, despite all the disparities that they may face. I don't have the actual answer answer, as in somebody studied it and I remember what they said, but I can... Uh, I can tell you that some of what I have understood as part of the issue is that the resilience overall may come from the fact that some communities have been exposed to so much adversity and oppression for so long that they have developed multiple coping mechanisms for the most recent form of, 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 of adversity. So religious or spiritual coping is very important in that community. There's many different ways in which people, you know, cope in different communities, black communities and other communities. In the Latino community, for example, it's also what people call uh, resignacion, or it translates in English poorly as being resigned, but it's much more of an active thing about almost mindfulness, where you mm -hmm. accept things you cannot change, basically, as a way of understanding that life is uh, full of suffering and it has been full of suffering for some communities for a very long time and therefore there are ways of addressing it but i i don't have the the study that i know that they looked at and maybe somebody in the group does that you know that they looked at this specifically for covid 19. okay so next we have uh cristiani duarte who has a question for you and if you give me one hot second here i'm going to um I have Chris answer her question in person. There you are, Chris, you can uh, unmute and um, Here I share am. your camera. Yeah, we can see you. There you are. Gotcha. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much, Roberto, for this. This was really a treat. Great, great talk. Um, so my question, I was thinking about the um, subjective appraisal results that you shared. And what I was thinking is that I think we can easily imagine a pathway, not so easily, but there must, there may be a pathway that goes from the structural factors that you examine to psychiatric disorders that doesn't necessarily may go through the experience, the individual experience appraisal of distress. 
so you may still have the effects but for example, you may not experience psych psychological distress, but you may have some health consequences, for example, um, that we may not be capturing if uh, we have been dedicating, I think, a lot of our attention to when the individual experiences the process of being um, a victim of this uh, structural factors um, as distressful. But that may not be the case in, in many, many instances. Uh, and I, I think the, we're, ourselves as a field have kind of neglected this pathway that I think could be very, very important. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about it. Um, yeah, I'm shaking my head, as you can see. Um, I, uh, I agree with you. Um, it, in this talk, the the purpose that of that section was I specifically selected a study where subjective appraisal had even greater effect than objective findings because I wanted to make the point, you know, that 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 it's mediated that makes it complicated, but it isn't always mediated, as you say, and or, or it might be partially mediated I think the the question you're asking is is, you know, in the in the. Uh, in the mediation analysis, it would be a direct mediational effect from the stressor to the outcome, as opposed to a, an indirect mediation effect through a subjective experience. I think you're right, absolutely, that both are present. And in each, in any given uh, moment, some forms of uh, mediation are more active than others or individual people or for particular subgroups or for particular stressors or outcomes. That's uh, the point I was trying to make was the complexity of this and how it isn't as simple, if you will, as going well, hit over the head, you know, had a bad effect. Yes, most of the time hit over the head had a, has a bad effect, but there are some times when the person is able to metabolize through some resilience mechanisms or all sorts of other things, that adversity into something that isn't so bad. Or in, other, in the other way, some people are more vulnerable through the subjective appraisal. And what seems from the outside to be not such a bad stressor turns out to be horrible. So I was essentially just making that point, but you're absolutely right. It, it shouldn't be taken as it, it never, no objective reality never has an effect on on our mental health uh, situation, not the case. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, okay, so now I, um, Melanie Wall has a question. And so she <laughs> about should what be- what I said about mediation. I'm sure I said something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there she is. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Um, so that was an amazing talk, Roberto. I actually learned a ton watching it and I learn a ton every time I hear you speak. So thank you for doing that. And I wanna say thank you for talking about different methodologies for addressing intersectionality because I think this is a growing area in data science, um, which I care a lot about, is a place where we need to do better at that and work harder at finding better ways of doing it. But my question is not about mediation or data science, it's actually a services question, oh. um, which is actually about, I didn't hear you talk too much and I wonder if you could just talk a bit more about our medical and primary care colleagues and how there are ways to partner within that setting to help reduce disparities in mental health. And if you could speak a little bit to that. Yes, uh, I, it's a huge topic, and I, I will say just briefly uh, things that, that pop up in my head as I think about it answering. Um, I, I usually start with something that uh, is easy to forget, which is the structural uh, reasons why our medical system is structured the way it is, um, because it determines so much that comes afterwards. We, we, we have commodified the practice of medicine into something that is so brief and instrumental that it, it, is a, it, it, it is very hard to see how within this structure we can avoid disparities with situations that are designed in medical care to be overly individualized and physicalized, sort of the medicalization of everything. Uh, 
and the commodification of something that makes it into a 10 minute visit or a 15 minute visit. Once you add these kinds of constraints and they seem unshakable, I mean, to us, I mean, it's like, why can't we change that? Well, obviously there's a million reasons why it's hard, but the root of much of the disparity problems come from that because a lot of what is considered medical, you know, like Rudolf Virchow in the 19th century came up with social medicine precisely because people were suffering from famine and they were being seen medically as if they had a medical disease when in fact what the prescription that he wrote was food. And he was, uh, he was critiqued at the time you know, for being non-medical. But this is exactly part of the nature of the problem that we need to step back, examine the roots of the difficulty that are created, the adversities that are creating the disparities and then tackle those uh, in addition to tackling the physical elements that are the consequence of the disparities. But we will never address disparities fully if we don't you know, question the context in which we are providing care. I, I, I know that's a bit philosophical, but, but I, I think it's essential with respect to the, to the actual answer because almost anything else, you know, collaboration, working with communities, all of these are extremely important. I pointed out a little bit there, but without questioning ourselves and the frame in which our system provides care, we, we, we will never, in my opinion, overcome this situation. Okay, so um, I think we have time for one more question. And um, we have many, many more questions here that I will try and get to you um, that we're not gonna have time to answer. Um, but thank you very much, Dr. Wall. And um, Dr. Susser, um, we actually have two questions. We're gonna see if we can squeeze them in. So first of all, um, we have uh, Dr. Rice from OMH and he is going to ask a quick question. The quick answer. Hi, Roberto. I'm John Rice. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. As you know, I love the CFI and the way you put it today of, you know, taking the the initial construct and then looking at how someone interprets that and, and what it means to them is, is so crucial. I'm thinking too, in terms of the social inequities, social structural racism and oppression, where would you, where would you place limit with the limited funding we have? What would you target as kind of the primary place to make an intervention if we only had one or two places to do that? Thanks. You're asking us. This is the short question. Is that a, <laughs> um, uh, well? It, it depends. I guess it depends in my mind on what is the uh, what is the target in some way that we are going for. Is it prevention? Is it uh, symptom reduction? Um, uh, I I don't think I'm going to be able to give you a, a, a spur of the moment single answer, but um, I, in terms of, in terms of our own work, you know, as, as clinicians, I tend to go with the understanding of the person's experience as being super important. And I don't mean there's so much prevention and the more access issues and all the other elements. I mean, in the clinical encounter, I think it's super important that we understand where the person the priorities that the person places in terms of their own care and focus the training of people in terms of that, in terms of identifying those priorities and tackling those priorities with the help of an entire system so that it's identifying what, you know, in, in the CFI, it's the most troubling aspect of their presentation or the barriers that got in the way, asking, asking these elements about their own experience and context so that we can overcome the, uh, the barriers that come with respect to engaging them in care and, and actually providing care that is, that is relevant to their needs. But I, but, but I would preface all that by saying that there are so many I think it depends on what is the element that we are focusing on as being most important. Like if it's prevention, is it that treatment, uh, you know, symptom reduction? Is it that there, that there is a, a, a key element at, at all levels that may not be the same? That's the best I can do on the spur of the moment. 
Well, thank you very much. Sure. All right, unfortunately, we are at time. And so, um, Dr. Sussa, I think you're going to have to email uh, your question directly. Um, but thank you, everybody, so much um, for today's um, rounds. The talk was absolutely superb. And um, unfortunately, we couldn't get to all the questions. But many people commenting um, how much they enjoyed the talk. So thank you very much. And uh, we will see everybody next week. Thank, Bye -bye. thank you. Congratulations, Roberto. For thank you very much.